is the Media Police Post, broadcasting from the Fort Hall School of Government. In this show, we police the state of truth in the Republic. And because truth is communicated to us by journalists and analysts, we have made it our civic duty at the Fort Hall School of Government to put it to the test. We advance from two truths about the media. One, and according to Roger Stone, the media is either lazy or evil. And for the most part, it is both evil and lazy. That is why the truth, their truth, must be put to a test. Two, journalism is a verified gossip. In fact, what is presented to us as news analysis is gossip that has been verified by journalists. This gossip has to be ground truth. Mm -hmm. We will assess the state of truth in what they submit to the Republic, and we will pass verdict on what is true and what is not. For the record, we are not journalists. We are thinkers. We are not lazy or evil, and we do not verify gossip. What we give you is the truth, the truth that sets you free. On today's show, we will discuss ideas that reflect unformed and uninformed opinions and ideas that made you stupid. These are narratives that fell into the cognitive trap of we see things as we are, not as they are. Narratives based on conjuncture history and those that smack of envelope journalism. Welcome, CS and Tuem. What will we be discussing today? Now, President Uhuru Kenyatta is one patient and graceful man. Mm. I mean, how can a whole deputy president publicly declare his allegiance to another party and Uhuru doesn't admonish him? How can a deputy president rant on Twitter about his boss and Uhuru keeps his cool? How can this belligerent deputy be using state resources to defy the same government he is serving and Uhuru doesn't cut his resources? How can the Commander-in-Chief be this calm? But even as I ask these questions, allow me to describe the relationship to you between eagles and ravens. You see, mm -hmm. ravens are very stubborn birds. They love to provoke and to chocosa eagles when in flight. During flight, ravens sit on the backs of eagles and peck incessantly at their necks. They bite, peck, and basically pester the eagle. But the eagle does not respond. It doesn't try to shake off the raven. It simply flies at higher altitudes. And it does this because the higher the altitude, the harder it is for the raven to breathe. Once it gets to an altitude where oxygen levels are thin, the raven, oblivious of the high altitude, simply falls to the ground, dead. What's the lesson here? William Ruto is a political raven. And this is because, just like the raven, Ruto is persistent and annoying but oblivious to danger. Just like the raven, Ruto doesn't realize that the eagle, uh, that the eagle, his boss, is getting to high altitude he cannot sustain. Ruto thinks because he's on the back of the eagle, pecking and biting, the eagle is incapable of turning the tables. He forgets the eagle, Uhuru Kenyatta, plays the long game. Mm -hmm. He forgets the eagle, his boss can fly at higher altitudes because he's bigger in stature and has bigger lungs. To put it differently, William Ruto is foolishly convinced he can keep up with his boss. He reckons he can revolt against his boss and still be boss. We want to tell Mr. Ruto the following. Just like the ravens fall from the sky, he will sign off on his own political fall. Very soon he will run out of political oxygen and he will be dead mm. politically. Very tough words. A very interesting story there. I did not know that ravens did that and that they would then die. <laughs> <laughs> um, last week I read an op-ed by Professor Makao Mutua on The Elephant. It was titled, BBI, Kenya's Finest Jurists. This article made me feel stupid for two reasons. One, it was a regurgitation of the past two years from handshake to BBI to high court ruling against BBI. It added no deep insight or analysis. It stated the facts, which we already knew. Yeah. Two, despite the fact that there were five judges on the bench for the BBI decision, the article read like a personal tribute to Justice Joel Ngumi, <laughs> with a sentence for Justice Odunga and a mere mention of what he called the others on that bench. <laughs> well, this article was written because it had to be written, not because it was telling us something new. It was part of the campaign to make us believe that judicial activism is the right and only way for judges to make decisions. 
Think of judicial decisions as happening on a spectrum. On mm. one end of the spectrum is judicial activism. This is where the court makes the law, thereby taking over the role of the legislature. Great. On the opposite end of the spectrum is judicial restraint. restraint. Mm. This is where the courts solve disputes in accordance with the laws made by parliament. In the middle is judicial discretion. Mm. This is where the courts determine what is just using the law. The court makes balanced decisions that are a healthy dose of judicial restraint with a splash of activism. This is what is optimal. Kenya, however, is currently living through an era of populist criticism of government and general distrust of legislators and the laws they make. Mm. The result of this hostility has been the emergence of judicial activists. Mm. As I said in the past and according to Neil deGrasse Tyson, there are three kinds of truth. Mm. The first is objective truth. This is something that is true whether or not you believe it. The second kind of truth is personal truth. This is something that is true only to you. And the third kind of truth is political truth. Yeah. This is something that is true because it has been incessantly repeated to the point where it is believed and accepted as true. Now the idea that judicial activism is the right and only way for judges to make decisions is a political truth. It has and will be repeated continually until we believe it is true even though it is not. Mm -hmm. And I think that there are two probable solutions to this problem. The first is for us to educate the public on judicial discretion and its meaning. This will not happen because judicial discretion will be labeled alternative facts by some Twitter warriors. <laughs> and the second is for us to elect judges to the High Court in the same way we elect MPs. Then they will be directly accountable to the people of Kenya and they can rule the way they want. Ah, that's beautiful. Fantastic. I want to pontificate a little bit. I think we can all agree that Kenya's political tectonic plates have shifted so significantly that the political landscape and terrain would hardly be recognizable by someone who had time traveled to the present from 2017, let alone even from 2013. The landscape would simply not be recognizable. If indeed the political landscape has shifted so significantly, then maybe it is also time that the topography of government should also reflect this new landscape and terrain. Mm -hmm. The fact is, the executive in its current form was designed in response to a bygone political arrangement. Mm -hmm. So in the spirit of positive reinforcement, and if the fruits and dividends of the handshake doctrine are tangible and plain to see, then maybe the spirit of the time should precipitate a formalization of the handshake through a government of national unity, the national interest. Many governments around the world have often relied on such unifying machinery when they viewed it necessary to safeguard and secure the national interest in the face of common threats to the whole nation. Threats such as financial crisis, external aggression, and as in our case, political divisions, which have in the past proved devastating every election cycle. To be fair, we have made a lot of progress since 2007, 2008, but it will also be dishonest if we do not acknowledge that we have not yet secured all the things we promised to ourselves through the pre-2010 reform agendas. The most prominent of which came to be known as the Agenda 4 reforms, the enduring hallmark of which was the 2010 constitution. After more than a decade and after yet another two divisive election cycles, Maybe it is time we pause, take stock, and examine the life of the nation, for we are not only faced with a constitutional moment, it is also an existential moment. Even some of the major constitutional questions before our courts really boil down to being about deciding who we are as a nation and who we want to be. And if we are honest with ourselves, we would recognize that the political calm and peace we are now enjoying is because of the benevolence of political leaders who have put aside their differences for the good of country Absolutely. in the interest of propelling the country forward. But still being honest, having recognized that, we should just be as quick to recognize that we may not always have benevolent leaders. And so we cannot bank on the prevailing goodwill in perpetuity. So how do we secure more lasting and permanent solutions? If the Agenda Forum forms were secured through and overseen by a grand coalition government, maybe it is that kind of bipartisan effort that is required under a government of national unity. And the primary aim would be to secure lasting reforms that are not reliant on stopgap measures or future handshakes being necessitated. 
Recalling the pre-2010 reform agendas, the primary focus of the first three at the time was political stabilization. Presently, this political stabilization has been ushered in through the handshake. That being the case, if this handshake arrangement is formalized, it could potentially facilitate an Agenda 4 reform for our time and season. Agenda 4 was about long-standing issues and solutions, and it focused on measures to address constitutional, legal, and institutional reform, land reform, poverty and inequality, unemployment, national cohesion and unity, transparency and accountability. Much as there has been progress, some of these themes still recur today as issues in need of resolution. If we had indeed fully realized national cohesion and inclusion, we would not have seen the political tensions that we lived through after the last two election cycles and some of the accountability issues that bleed our coffers. Even the president, by his own admission, told us the handshake has enabled the atmosphere to deliver an impressive and robust development agenda in the second term. In light of the foregoing, it is probably time to formalize the cooperation under the handshake in some form, not only to forestall any possible political tension in the horizon, but also to bring us together to see through this generation's Agenda 4 reforms. This may take the form of BBI, either in its current form or in a revised form, so long as inclusion and resource equity remain the primary pillars. Hmm. What an interesting hmm. soliloquy. Did you hear you that? <laughs> <laughs> but I will say this, and as Professor Mutai Gunye said in the past, yeah. that if you do not have either constitutions precipitate a crisis if they're not made in times of crisis and mm. I think that what you're trying to tell us is that Agenda yeah. 4 came, was bred out of a crisis yeah. and therefore because it was bred out of a crisis it was the proper solution to our major problems mm. and Precisely. the constitution we then made in 2010 took out all the crisis and forgot all the problems we had mm. and will now reintroduce them yes. that the simple Absolutely. Long, long and short. Yeah. I, I see what you did there. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for joining us on Media Police Post. Columnists, we put you on notice. See you next Monday. God bless.